Welcome to the channel, folks. My name's Shane. A few days ago, I posted a story on Instagram saying, ask me a question. And I got a lot of replies. So I'm going to take five of those right now and make this quick little video. I hope you like it. The first question is from Kentucky Blues Boy. He says, why are all flying Vs being marketed towards heavy metal and rock and roll and not blues? I think it just comes down to what people see the most. You know, as, as beloved as blues is, there's definitely not as much of it being sort of promoted or pushed anywhere. It just... It's one of those things, at least not here in Australia. Same goes for overseas in the US. Heavy metal bands are a whole lot more popular than blues bands on the most part. You look at any of the guitar channels on YouTube, the metal ones, they all outdo anyone that's in a different niche. They're just really, really popular. It's an extremely popular form of music. And I think they've got sort of so much attitude about them in terms of their shape that they've just been adopted by the metal guys. And you might be thinking, Hang on a sec, didn't the metal guys, weren't they the first ones using it? No, nah. check out my wall. Albert King, I don't know if he was the first, but he was the first blues guy I ever saw play one. And he's still my favorite Flying V player, without question. Although he's not with us anymore, he's amazing. So thanks for the question. The next question's from PRMJ032004. He says, where do I get my guitars? It's kind of like a loaded question, <laughs> but the quick answer to this is, I get them wherever I see the ones that I love. I don't box myself into one guitar shop. I generally try to visit as many as I can. I like to sort of see what I can find along the way. Some I've bought from random shops here in Australia. I get a lot of my most recent left-handed ones from Sky Music here in Melbourne, Australia. But I've bought guitars in Daytona Beach, Florida. I bought them in Chicago. I bought them anytime I've traveled to the US. Just anywhere, anywhere and everywhere. So I just keep an eye out. A lot of people think I've got some sort of radar for left-handed guitars. It's not the case. I just try and find as many as I can. And now, to be fair too, thanks to the YouTube channel, I get a lot of offers to have guitars sent, which also helps. Dan Electro and Toman were nice enough to send some guitars out. But that's it. I, the rest of them that I find and source locally and buy, or while I travel, I just sometimes get pretty lucky with it. So that's what it comes down to. The next question is from Catfish Klein. He says, what's the best way to learn licks? So as you can see back here, I've got a lot of posters on my wall with some of my favorite artists of all time. One of the best ways you can learn is just to keep your ears open, listen to as much stuff as you can, and then try to play the stuff that you hear that you can also recall. Now, this is a big part of learning how to play. I think the first thing you need to do is just play the pentatonic scale, just learn where the notes are, and then stop, and then work out, even position one, right? Just learn that, and then stop, and then also... Use that as a reference point for most of the licks that you have, a lot of blues players use. They're all around that area. Now, there's guys that will play outside of that a lot, like Chris Kane and some of these other guys, Tommy Castro, but a lot of the straight-up blues licks are around that pentatonic shape. There are some, obviously, variations on it as well, but that's a good starting point. And play those. You've really got to try to connect the mind to the hand and also to the ear. It's a sort of like a three-step process. So for me... The easiest thing for me was to learn off a DVD back in the day. If I could see it and hear it, I could then sort of connect it a little bit better to my hand and to my mind. One thing you should always take into account, though, is don't try to learn too much too soon. Play either half the lick, if you can only play half of it, and remember it, and then play it to death until you can't forget it. And then move on to either the second part or a different lick. You should spend one day playing one lick. Some people are blessed and they can kind of, I guess learn something really, really quickly and then recall it day after day. But for me, I have to really drill it into my hands. It's the only way that I can get it to sort of stick in my mind. There's times I've spent like a week working out licks and then finally I could get it. The muscle memory was there and I can play it every time that I need to. So it's all about muscle memory. It's about using your ears and only try and play the parts that you can actually learn and don't try to over, over sort of absorb too much at once. That's a huge tip. Absolutely. <laughs> the next question is from Mum Spadetti. I like that name. That's hilarious. It says, do you think there's any reason for tube amps to still exist other than the nostalgia? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's something to be said for all the technology that makes studio recording easier, even doing gigs too, you know, like taking a Kemper or a Helix to a show and plugging straight into the PA system. But then there's a feeling that just comes from playing through a tube amp that most solid state, you know, modeling amps or transistor amps, whatever, can't really get that same sort of vibe. It just, it's fact. I've played so many great solid state amps over the year and I'm, I'm a huge fan of many of them, but there's really something special about cranking up, say, a Marshall DSL 40 and having that sound in the room. It's amazing. It's great as the player, gives you a response and a feel that, you know, 
just plugging straight into the PA is not going to give you. You can almost replicate it, and that could be a much easier thing for a touring touring musician. But if you're playing at a pub and you're, you can bring your amp in or whatever, then it's a great feeling, and I think they'll never go away. You know, as great as technology will get, the valve amp guys and the tube amp guys will still want that sound. They'll still want that feel, responds a certain way with pedals, all that kind of good stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think they'll be around for the long haul, and I think what your question basically asked, uh, is there anything other than nostalgia? It's more about the feel, the sound, all that kind of stuff. I don't see them ever going away. And our final questions from Nikon Nicholas Nick. I guess his name's Nick and he takes photos with a Nikon or Nikon camera. Are there any upcoming products you're excited to try? I think the first thing that I'd really like to find out about, and this is maybe a little bit of a different topic and there'll be a video coming up about this, but you know, there's three main operating systems. There's kind of four, but there's three main ones. You've got Windows, you've got Mac OS, and then you've got Linux. There's also Chrome OS, but we won't talk about that. I actually want to see whether or not we can get some a good digital audio workstation set up by using Linux. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. But in terms of conventional gear, you know what? I've got everything I really need. I don't get overly hyped up anymore for gear, but there's definitely a few things that are on my radar to at least try. And one of those is the Lion 6 Helix. Now, Dr. Rick's already had that at my place before and we shot some videos with it, but I didn't get a chance to really deep dive through it. So I really want to compare that to the Kemper and see what that's all about see what the pros and cons of both and see which one is better for not only a studio guy, but obviously someone who goes out and plays live as well. They sound great. I've had a chance to plug into one through a PA system just briefly and I liked it a lot, but that's one thing I definitely want to sort of deep dive into and find out more about. Thanks for watching guys. My name's Shane. I hope you liked this video. If it was enjoyable, give it a thumbs up. I appreciate that. So what I'm going to do on the next one of these videos is simply take five questions from the comment section on YouTube and I'll mix it up. I'll go between Instagram and then back to YouTube from time to time too, and then take the best questions. So feel free to ask me some questions. I'm gonna use these as a little bit of a resource library as well for questions I see come in that I, either I like or frequently ask questions as well. I used to do a mailbag like maybe seven or eight years ago if you go back and I just stopped doing it. So live streams kind of replaced them, but I think these make for some interesting topics. So thanks for the questions and I'll catch you on the next one. See ya.